All right, so I think we're live on Facebook. Welcome everybody. My name is Melina Abdullah and this is not a drill. This is our weekly Facebook program for Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, um, which we began at the start of the pandemic as a tool to get information out to Black people. And then as we moved forward, we realized there's a lot of information we need to get out. We needed a political space, a space for political education. So this is not a drill, became that space for Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. We are here every Thursday night, inshallah, to lift up the issues that are important to our people. Um, and so before we get started, we just wanted to give a few updates. We know that last week we ousted District Attorney Jackie Lacey. And so everybody <laughs> is encouraged to clap, drop notes in the comments. You know, it has been a long struggle, many years of trying to get our two term, the two term district attorney who mm. oversaw the murders of 626 people mm. at the hands of police without prosecuting the police, without meeting with the constituency that she claimed to represent. Um, so it took many years to get her out, including more than three years of weekly direct sustained protest on the steps of her office every single week from October 2017 mm -hmm. to the present. We were on her steps. We've been to her house. We've written petitions. We've written articles. We faxed her, we called her, we followed her everywhere we knew she would be. Uh, we summoned in ancestors, we summoned in the spirits of those whose bodies have been stolen by violence. Um, and on Friday, it was just declared that in fact, she had been beaten. Um, it was confirmed and we had a victory party um, and are claiming that as a first step in his first, and some people go, well, why did you usher the black woman out? We're reminded of Zora Neale Hurston's words that all skin folk and kin folk. Mm. And Jackie Lacey was one of those skin folk who absolutely was not kin folk. Um, her replacement, we wanna be very clear, we did not endorse any candidate, mm. but her replacement was her only opposition in the runoff. His name is George Gascon. Um, the first meeting that he took since being named district attorney elect was with Black Lives Matter. And so on Monday night, um, we um, as physically distanced um, as we possibly could held a meeting in the basement of McCarty Memorial Church with more than 20 families of those who've been killed by police. Um, and we had an entire agenda planned, but it was most important that those families told the stories of, the, of their loved ones. Um, in that meeting, DA Gascon or DA elect Gascon committed to regular meetings with Black Lives Matter, committed to individual meetings with the families and committed to reopening at least four cases and probably more. Um, and he named the cases that he would reopen. He also named cases for which there was no determination um, that he would be examining. And he committed to also working on legislation that enabled him to prosecute more police officers. He also committed to no death penalty cases. So no cases moving forward would be tried as capital punishment cases. Hmm. And those that were currently um, death penalty cases would be redesignated and okay. um, no death penalty would be um, uh, a part of his um, administration. He would not be pushing for the death penalty in any case. And then finally he committed to working towards 100% youth decarceration. So our young people will absolutely not be transferred to adult jails and prisons. And we work on um, policies that much like um, San Francisco um, decarcerate our young people where there's virtually no youth 
in jails or prisons in San Francisco County. Um, and forgot one more thing, no more enhancements. So people mm -hmm. may be prosecuted for the crimes that they're accused of, but would not be given things like gang enhancements mm -hmm. that um, disproportionately impact Black folks um, in LA County. So we thought that was a really mm -hmm. successful first Maybe meeting. We of course have to continue to work. Um, but that's what we're working on. And now we got to figure out what we're going to do with our Wednesday afternoons. Um, so Alex Villanueva, the yeah. sheriff of LA County is next on the list of the folks who got to go. <laughs> um, so with that, that was just our Black Lives Matter Los Angeles update, quick update. Um, we want to remind folks that you can get our weekly emails by signing up at blmla.org, blmla.org. On social media, we are BLM Los Angeles on Instagram and BLMLA on Twitter. And so today, as we move forward, you know that we frame ourselves in Black Lives Matter as abolitionists. We absolutely believe in toppling systems of injustice. And we know the other half of abolition is building the kinds of structures under which we want to live. And so as we talk about doing both, we're talking about how to stop gentrification, how to stop gentrification in Los Angeles, where we are losing Black community at such a rapid pace. And then how do we reclaim Black community both in Los Angeles and beyond? So our guests for tonight's show, are two elected officials that happen to hold those posts, but are freedom fighters in their being. Um, we are deeply grateful to have Charles Barron of the New York State Assembly and Inez Barron of New York City Council join us hailing from Brooklyn, East New York, and they are going to um, really give us some instruction around what it is they've done. They've done some phenomenal work in East New York in claiming Black space and preserving Black space for Black residents. So we're very honored to have them join us. Um, we'll also be joined by Black Lives Matter Los Angeles members, Damian Goodman, founder of Downtown Crenshaw. There is no stronger um, advocate for claiming and holding Black space than Brother Damien and Nikki Okuk, who is our wonderful, um, really visionary around how to build Black economies and um, has done tremendous work around um, both claiming space, but also Black cooperative economics. Um, and so we'll be in discussion. I'm going to shut up and sit back and learn from our four guests tonight and um, just be grateful that they're here with us. I want to remind our Facebook viewers, if you drop questions or comments um, in the comment section, we will be fed those comments Rajay and Megan are, uh, are behind the scenes folks who are feeding those comments to us. And we're also, as always, grateful to Pro Bono ASL for providing our sign language translation. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for joining us tonight as you do every single week. And so with that, can we just open up? I know that um, Brother Charles and Sister Inez um, come from a long history of struggle. And we were joking during our pre-gathering, long history of struggle, <laughs> um, uh, dating back to the late 1960s, I believe, to, to struggling for Black freedom um, as far back as the late 1960s, but now an elective office, really not becoming your office, but using your office to advocate for power for the people. Can you talk with us about what you were able to do and why you visioned this reclamation of black space in East New York? And um, Assemblyman Barron, maybe we'll start with you. Well, first of all, I wanna thank you so much for having us on. We greatly appreciate it. And we start from the premise, we started an organization called Operation Power, people organizing and working for empowerment and respect. First and foremost, we don't think we can vote our way to liberation. 
Mm. It is a tactic. It is a strategy. Secondly, we're not just about issues, singular issues. We're about the systemic destruction, dismantling of the capitalist system. You know, a lot of people was talking about uh, Trump and yes, he was terrible and everybody's glad he's gone, but capitalism is still here. And whether you are Biden or Harris or Trump or Spence, of course, there are differences, but all four of them support a racist, parasitic, predatory capitalist system. I say colonial capitalist system and a warmongering imperialistic foreign policy. The demarcations in between that is Trump is the craziest, most insane person ever to hold office, but capitalism is even more deadly. And I'd like to see our leaders speak out more against capitalism and not just racism, because when you narrowly focus on racism, which is colonial capitalist ideology is racism that permeates the institutions, the minds of individuals, but the system is colonial capitalism. And even Bernie Sanders, you won't ha hear him say, we got to dismantle capitalism and replace it with socialism. You'll hear him say that we need a Green New Deal, agree. We need Medicare for all, agree. We need to eliminate the college loan debt, agree. We need to regulate Wall Street, agree. But we need to, Bernie, dismantle capitalism and replace it with a socialist system. So we understand that we have to deal with a strategy in the meantime. So before we get to dismantling uh, the socialist system, and we believe Africa, the liberation of Africa is central to liberation of African people everywhere. When Africa is liberated and its resources go to African people on the continent and in the diaspora, particularly the African working class, not the African bourgeoisie leadership that has taken over a lot of the countries, so we're facing a kind of domestic colonialism right here in America. Most black communities are controlled by a colonial capitalist system. And so we don't own the land. We don't own the businesses. We don't own any of the social cultural institution. The first edict of the Black Panther Party was that we want freedom. We want the power to determine the destiny of our communities. And we want complete and total control over all of the institutions that govern our community. With that as an opening, I'd like to say also that we feel strongly in our beloved East New York that revolution starts from the bottom up, not from Biden down, but from the bottom up. And we believe that the second phase of our struggle, the first phase was to get the black neo-colonial puppets of the Democratic Party out of local positions like in the city council and in the state assembly where the power is. We need them out. We are tired of complaining about them, calling them ancient mamas, uncle Tom, sell out this, sell out that, irrelevant. If you can't beat them, they don't care what you call them. So we took out the local black democratic party club and every black community in New York City and New York state, the Democrats control the politics of that community, the local politics. So the only way to make real headway is you got to get them out. With Operation Power, we did. We have the city council seat and we have the state assembly seat. The importance of the city council seat is power. The great equalizer is power. In New York City, there are 8 million people, 2 million are Africans, another 2.3 million are Latino and Latinas or Latinx or whatever folks say. So the majority population in New York City is black, Latino, and Asian. That's 62%. We have a city council number of 51 members of the city council. When I was there, 27 were black, Latino, and Asian, mm -hmm. which had the power to vote on an 80, 90 billion dollar budget. So if you got that kind of power and don't use it for the people, you got to go. You got to go. So we've been trying to get, we've been trying to get authentic black radical 
leaders elected to local office. Dr. Lonnie Quinnell said in her book that some of us are descriptively black, they look like us, and others are authentically black, they are committed to us. So we're trying to get the descriptively black folk out and put in authentically black people who are committed to black liberation. That's what we did. One of the powers that the city council has in addition to passing the budget and passing municipal laws and oversight over all the agencies is the power over land use. Whoa, Malcolm X said land is the basis for freedom. While we can't choose the developer, but we can determine what's going to be developed on the land. They have a process called the EULA process, the Unified Land Use Review Process, where it has to end up in the city councilor's office. We have the last word on what's going to be built on city-owned land. So in East New York, every time a developer came in and they tell me they want to build 100 units of housing in my beloved district of East New York, and they tell me that it's going to be affordable, or my first question is affordable to who? And who's defining and determined affordability? They said, well, affordability is the AMI, the area median income. And HUD defines affordability as 80% of the AMI, the area median income. Well, in New York City, the area median income from New York City is up to 90 something thousand dollars. This is $100,000 now is the AMI. When I was in, it was 80, 6,000, now it's 100,000. So 80% of the 100,000 is about what, 70, 70 something thousand dollars for a family of three. And when I was in, 80% of the AMI was 64,000 for a family of three. So I asked the developer, I said, oh, this is really affordable for our community. Uh, what is, um, do you know the AMI of my neighborhood? He said, no. I said, sir, you are going to come into my office, tell me you're building affordable housing for my people in my district, and you don't even know the neighborhood AMI. This meeting is terminated. I ended the meeting. He said, wait, wait, wait. I can't get that on my phone right now. No, no. Bye. This meeting is terminated. I made him go away for three weeks. He could have had it in three minutes. I made him go away for three weeks rescheduled the meeting, he came back and he said, it's uh, 36,000 for a family of three. So if my area median income is 36,000 for a family of three, and you're telling me you're gonna build housing at 80% of the AMI, which then was 60 something thousand, now it's 70 something thousand, that ain't happening because I got the juice. I said, let me tell you what it's going to be, else the project is going to die. And I'll tell you how we have the juice. I said, 80% of the people in my area, we're going to do the income ban, the income ban of East New York. If 80% of us are making less than $50,000, we're going to go down to 50,000, 40,000, 30,000, 25,000. And that's going to be 80% of the housing or the apartments. And then 15, 20% of us do make 60, 70, 80,000. So we'll make that 20%. That's what it's going to be. And that's what we got. And since that time, we have such a reputation that developers come to us, there is no negotiations that we know, we know, and they just lay out the AMI. We don't even have to fuss with anybody because the power is in the city council. That project had to go to the land use committee and the subcommittee of the land use on zoning. So those nine members or those seven members, they're going to call me up and say, Baron, we got a project coming into your district. What do you say? Up or down? Said, not, not this one. I don't even have to demonstrate. They, they'll vote it down. So even if Donald Trump, when he was president, would have come into East New York and said he wanted to build Trump Towers on Blake Avenue in my neighborhood, he would have to see the Black Panther. 
and I would tell him he was fired like he is now. And I would tell him he could not <laughs> have that on that block. Why? Because we got the power. There's no reason why Harlem should be gentrified. And there's no reason why bed should be gentrified. There's no reason why Atlanta should be gentrified. Atlanta was 70% black 10, 20 years ago. It's now 51% black. So when your neighborhood is gentrified and you got a black mayor and 13 black council members in Atlanta, or when bed is gentrified and you got all black elected officials, you can't blame it on no white vote. You, you allow gentrification to come in. We stopped it in East New York. So, so the comments that are coming in, including one of our members are, this is a state assembly member? Oh my God, right, is <laughs> what they're saying. Because what you're lifting up is something that is never seen in places like Los Angeles. Um, we're fed the idea that gentrification is a given and that there's nothing that we can do other than build monuments to the Black people who used to live there. Mm. And so I'd love for Sister Inez to kind of come mm -hmm. in and weigh in on what it is, where do you all collectively, one, I, I know that it comes from being a unit too, that you, you can affirm each other, um, but where do you all um, come in as elected officials and really come in with this um, audacity and vision, right? And, and commitment to, to make things the way that you vision them? It's in our DNA. It's in our DNA. Uh, you talk about long-term. The first demonstration that I participated in was back in 1960. A friend of mine grabbed me by the hand and she said, come on, we're going to go down on Fulton Street and we're going to protest because we're going to support the people in the South who don't have the ability to go into those uh, McCrory's and Woolworth's and sit at the counter. So, my parents instilled that in me, and I grew up in a church that understood that we are, are part of an African culture and that Africa is all throughout the Bible. Mm -hmm. My mother always told me that I was beautiful, and I believed everything she said. She told me I was smart. She always encouraged me. She was very much involved in what was going on in my school and made sure that uh, when I made a claim that a teacher was discriminating against me, that she was there the next day to address that matter. So it's, it's in my DNA. I was raised that way through my parents. They brought us up that way, my brothers and sisters. And so it was easy for me to be able to continue that. My mother was herself very much involved in protest movements and being involved and in being very outspoken. And not just on behalf of the individuals in our family, but on behalf of others as well, as Charles's mother is the same way. Mm -hmm. She spoke up for anyone that she felt was being um, abused or mistreated. So it's in our DNA. Uh, we were able to be a part of a church in the 70s, no, I guess it was in the 80s, in the 80s, first the House of the Lord Church, which was in the leadership of organizing and protesting and, and holding people's feet to the fire and not being afraid. What we're looking at today, uh, Charles and I have been doing some reading and we've come across these terms, obsequious sycophants. Those people who have been in office, who think they've got to kowtow to the power structure, who think they've got a brown nose and who think that they're not worthy of being able to assert themselves on behalf of their people. So what we've got to do is stand up. When you stand up and you're speaking truth, mm -hmm. people see that and they acknowledge that. And when we walk down the street, people say like, give them hell, Charles, give them hell, you know, <laughs> make them pay, you know, <laughs> keep speaking for us, black man. So we get that kind of encouragement because what we say in our home, what we say in the streets is the same things that we say in the halls of power, in those seats where decisions are made that are impacting and affecting not just our lives, but our children and our grandchildren behind us. So we're proud to stand and to say, this is what it is, this is what we believe, and to know that uh, in the end, we will be born out, it's a battle. And we have those who are 
serving with us who don't have the same kind of um, anatomy, don't have that backbone, don't have that strength. And we call them out, we mm-hmm. talk to them, we tell them, we try to encourage them. And in fact, there is an impact that's being made particularly in the state level, particularly where Charles is and where he's having an opportunity to dialogue. Uh, as Charles has said in the city, the city council has the ability to approve land use projects. If you want city money, if you want to go higher than what's already zoned, if you want a greater density than what already exists, you've got to come and get approval. So you go first to the community board, but that's a recommendation. Then you have to go to city planning. But then when you get to the city council, if the local council member has said, look, this project does not meet what I think are the needs of my community. This project is overpriced for my community. That project will die. But we've got people who are Black people whose median incomes in their communities are perhaps 40,000, 50,000, yet they allow projects to come in that require people to have an income of $90,000, $100,000, or even $130,000. They call that affordable, but it's not affordable to the people who presently live there. So if in fact you are as the representative and as the person with the authority and the power to stop a project, if you are in fact not stopping it, but allowing it to come in, Mm -hmm. you are in fact, advancing gentrification, ethnic cleansing, or all of those terms. Now these same people are complaining. Oh, these gentrifiers are, are coming into our community and, and they're bringing in another element. And, and, and this, is, this is not gonna be good for our people. You undermine yourself. You undermine the opportunity for people in our community who are black and brown to be able to coalesce, to have a source, to have a strength, and to be able to exercise their will through you as a representative speaking on their behalf. So it's an opportunity for people to see us standing up, Mm -hmm. knowing that we're not doing this to advance our career in politics, to make friends, to curry favor with those in power. No, that's Mm -hmm. not why we're here. That's not why we do it. Uh, Can I just tell you something that she did? And she's being modest. Let me tell you what this sister did here. I'm so proud of her. We have some land in our neighborhood. And we had this, matter of fact, Governor Cuomo's sister Mm -hmm. built these shelters on four square blocks, right? One square block. One square block and four shelters. It's a two-story shelter with 200 of our people in it. And they had a a courtyard in the middle. They came to this sister here. Mm and said, we want to knock that down and build 300 units of housing. And then instead of all of the shelters being around like that, we're going to take it up 10 stories and give them a brand new shelter. (laughs) This sister said, no, you're not. Not in my neighborhood. As a matter of fact, I'm going to reject that. They went and got the mayor, Mayor Bill de Blasio, called up Inez and said, I'd like to meet with you. I need this project. I need to talk to you. I said, fine, we can talk now and I'll get Charles on the phone. He said, no, I'll come to East New York. Most people can't get the mayor to come to their neighborhood. I'll come to East New York to meet with y'all. He came into my office, told this sister here, "Uh, I need that project. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want for your community? We said, we don't roll like that, mayor. Ain't no quid pro quo. We don't roll like that. The bottom line, here's what we want. We want you to do 500 units of housing, Mm -hmm. no shelter, and put those 200 people in a permanent apartment. That's what we want. Mm -hmm. You know what he said? Well, if I can't get this project, it's just going to stay like it is. This is on Friday. And the project was already before the city council. Mm -hmm. He went back to the city council got all of those six, seven, eight members, nine members of the committee it was in to try to get them to go against the councilwoman. They said, no, (laughs) that Monday we get a call from land use. And they said, uh, the project went through 
it's going to be 500 units of housing, no shelter, and 200 of our people are going to be in a permanent apartment. That's the system here. <laughs> Uh, yes, like that, it, that's easy for me to do and to fight like that because I'm following the model that Charles laid out because Charles was the, the council member before I became the council member. So Charles started out in the council and he laid it out and he presented that model and, and he showed that we can fight and we can be principled and we can get things for our people without kowtowing, brown nosing, and, and acquiescing to people because they are quote in power. So it was easy for me to continue what he had already started. So we have more housing in our community that is affordable to the people who live there now than any other any district. Other one. We Radical. have affordable <laughs> housing for the people who live there. Because right. you say affordable to whom? So if right. you can afford $130,000 as your income, then you can afford that for those apartments that are coming in. But our people, again, are at 35,000 and we've got to make sure that we don't let them be forced out, pushed out and, and moved out of their community where they have been subjected over the years previously to a lack of services. And now that it's coming around, now that it's changing, you want to force them out? We say, mm -hmm. no, no, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. So we want to get Damien and Nikki into this conversation because we don't have the kind of elected leadership here that you all are modeling in East New York, right? Um, we have <laughs> projects that are slated to be taken over by um, uh, extensions of the Trump regime. And so, um, you know, we know that when we give up land use to bodies like this, it also, and we haven't said this yet, so this is the only reason I'm saying it is for the folks who are on, that it forces our folks out. And so we used mm -hmm. to have really strong black community in Los Angeles. I've been here mm -hmm. since the mid to late nineties. Um, and there was a time when the Crenshaw district was all black, when you didn't have to see anybody mm -hmm. but black folks, right? Now our folks are being scattered to places like the Inland Empire and the Antelope Valley because all of these bodies are coming in and building housing that they're calling affordable housing that is not affordable, as you say, to the people who currently live there, um, but also land is being used for a capitalist gain. And mm -hmm. so Damien, can you just um, quickly frame what's happening in Crenshaw and why we're seeking to usher in something new and more visionary and authentically Black? I thought I was the only one who um, <laughs> quoted tyranny of the majority all the time, but see, I knew we were kindred spirits. So, so thank you, Damien. I just want to start off and say I am happy just sitting back here listening to the gospel of the barons for the rest of the meeting. I wish all of the local black elected officials and the rest of the people who are leading the black institutions in Los Angeles for whom they listened to were here in listening to this conversation. Uh, Brother Keeley has known the barons for a while. I had the opportunity to go out uh, under the uh, National Emergency Summit on Gentrification that was called by Dr. Ron Daniels uh, uh, it, around King's Day of Sacrifice, around April 4th of last year, 2019, mm -hmm. where I got the chance to actually meet Charles and Inez in person. Mm -hmm. And this amazing body that had people from over 17 different cities throughout America, many of the legacy civil rights leaders were there, um, but most folks who were on the ground in, 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 in fighting gentrification and promoting housing justice had been there whether it was Atlanta or DC or Chicago or San Francisco or LA, we were all there. The only time, over 50 of us, the only time all of us got up and stood and clapped was when Charles told us what he was doing with his lovely wife in East New York, because it is not just theory. We have talked about this for a very long time. It's not even, when I, I remember we had a conversation, Akili, Charles and I had a conversation and we told them that the former plan for the Crenshaw Mall was 90% market rate. Wow. We're talking about two bedrooms that go for $5,200 a month in a community where the median household income for a family of four is 40,000. He's wow. he, he, exactly, 
Exactly. It's foreign. It would be an abomination if anyone attempted to bring that to the barons of East New York. I, I don't. I doubt they would have gotten out the room alive. Right? <laughs> so, so when we talk about what we need to do here, at the very least, we have to get these this brother and this sister up and in front of every organization, every black elected official to say that you can stop gentrification. Mm -hmm. Not only can you stop gentrification, but you can make developers build to a level affordable to the community. That's right. I will never forget when uh, when uh, when Charles and Akili and I said, you, 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 you had mentioned Charles that some elected officials say, well, I can only get 25% or 30% affordable. Right. Said, That's a punk. <laughs> <laughs> If they don't, if they don't, if they can't build to the level of affordability of community, don't let them build. So from right. that, we, we got what we what we named uh, through the other organization I run, the Crenshaw Subway Coalition, what we call the Baron Rule, which is <laughs> we can't afford it, don't build it. Don't build it. That's it's right. really simple. It's really yeah. simple. And so what we had done, and and we when we came back from that summit in 2019 with all of these leaders inspired by so many stories of people who were doing inspired by the, the work that has been done in East New York as we said we have to go a little bit further from just advocating right we had been very long uh, and, and strong passionate voices on transportation justice racial justice housing justice but we felt that we needed to be in control of these decisions because frankly too many decisions too many bad decisions were being made and they were being made for for just greed Greed among the, even greed among the affordable housing complex. I'm not even going to get into that. People mm -hmm. making loads of money building projects that weren't necessarily affordable. Interesting stat, most of the affordable, the largest affordable housing builders in America are not nonprofit enterprises. They are for-profit enterprises. Right. What does that tell you? It tells you, you can make money building affordable housing, right? Mm -hmm. right? You make less money than you would if you were building, if you're building market rate housing and gentrifying communities, but you still make money. That's right. <laughs> And some of them can just make less money by building right. truly affordable down to what we call the neighborhood median income. And so we said, we can do this. We've got all this expertise. We have people like the, Paul Yelder, who was the first executive director of Dudley Neighbors Initiative, the transformative community land trust project in the Dorchester community, in the Roxbury community, in Boston. We've got folks who are practitioners in, 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 in advancing the work of community-centered development, community-focused development. And we have people that know how to and have advocated for a long time strategy in this community, going back to the last uprising or the previous uprising, the 92 uprising around Rodney King, in which people have asserted that the way and the method of community revitalization is through community ownership, right? That it can't be enough that we simply make a few black people rich bringing in a bunch of national change so that they can extract our money from our community and enrich their shareholders. We have to have a different model. Mm -hmm. We have to advance the work and the method of seeking to say, I'm in a community right now where the median household income for a family of four is 40,000. I got brothers and sisters who are on section eight because they can't afford anything. How can they participate mm -hmm. in this project and become more stable, right? How can we lift up the masses of people and, and how can we be engaged in a manner that is authentically community-centric? Not where we're just talking about community benefits, but community ownership, community growth, community mm -hmm. ownership at every stage of the project. And so when we saw that the, our beloved Crenshaw Mall, you know, the most iconic economic center mm -hmm. in all of Black Los Angeles, right? At the intersection of Crenshaw and King, and I got to give a shout out to Tori Reese. He's been, he's been moving on changing or adding, I should say adding, as they have in New York, adding Malcolm X to Crenshaw Boulevard so that mm -hmm. that intersection will soon be the intersection of MLK right. and Malcolm X, adding Malcolm X to Crenshaw Boulevard. And so at our Freedom Square, which is called right now, we saw that a bunch of gentrifiers were just focused in on trying to take advantage of Donald Trump's Opportunity Zone program, oh. right? It has been called the largest opportunity zone potential project in America. It is at a transit station that we fought for because we believed that the transit system was being expanded, that black people deserve to have that same access, right? But we, we saw that all of these speculators and these developers were focused on how they could take advantage of this gold mine to eradicate the center, the nexus of black Los Angeles. And we said, nah, let's just do, forgive the term, let's just, use the Trump card. <laughs> I'm using it in the, in the small T term. 
let's just go buy it ourselves. And so what has happened in, 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 in getting people focused on using this time of black awareness, black consciousness is a coming together of community with the best of professionals locally match with the best of professionals nationally to say, this must be a new model of development of, for, and by the community. One in which we're not just talking about how many big corporate chains we can be in, but Sister Nikki is gonna talk about how we bring in worker-owned and consumer-owned cooperatives. And even if they aren't that, finding some kind of way in which we're not allowing Walmarts to come in where the shareholders are rich and the workers are in, on welfare, right? How can we bring together a system of investment where, where grandmama can put in her 500, 5,000 or 50,000 and get the same amount of return from the development as the big banks would, right? How can we actually look at and get so that we can have a, a, a project in which we as a community control the destiny of our future? And so, I mean, I've just been encouraged and enthused by the, the level of energy and attention toward and have been uh, uh, just honored that we have had brothers and sisters like Nikki come in and lead this piece. I'm just gonna step back a little bit, let Tiki, Nikki take some stage and enjoy listening to the gospel according to the Barons. Uh, well, Nikki, uh, thank you, Damien. So Nikki, we really do wanna get this kind of larger um, economic frame because when Damien came with, we gonna buy them all y'all, I'm like, why would we buy them all? Like a mall is a bad investment right now, right? Um, but it is a part, not just of replacing mall ownership with black folks owning a mall. It's about reframing what economic structures work for black people who live in the Crenshaw district like us, right? And so can you give us a little bit about what economic positioning we have to come from. So not replacing white capitalism with black capitalism, but thinking about cooperative economics and how we can use this as an opportunity to begin to push that model. And I'm gonna ask you to keep it a little tight because we're starting to run short on time and there's a million questions um, in the chat. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's there's a lot to unpack here. And I think it's really unfortunate that in the United States, there's not a more of a sort of culture or knowledge around collective and cooperative economics. I think I find when I travel abroad that they're all over, you know, you walk down a street in London and there's a cooperative daycare and a cooperative grocery store. And even if folks are not engaging with them on a regular basis, like they understand sort of how they work because they've done it at least once in their life. But in our situation, um, I find that most folks don't know very much about it. And a really great place for everybody to start is with the book Collective Courage, because it frames up for us exactly how Black folks have used cooperative economics for generations, starting with like putting together savings clubs to buy our own damn selves out of slavery up until, you know, one of the largest shipyards in Boston was uh, was owned and operated by Black workers because they were being discriminated against at other places and they became incredibly successful. Now, the tragic ending though of that huge shipyard that employed both black folks and white folks was that the competitors got so frustrated with them that they went to the landlord and had their rents raised and put them out of business. And damn near the same thing happened to me. I spent the last six, seven years building a recycling company in Compton and same thing happened. CBRE, huge commercial real estate holder put me out of my 22,000 foot warehouse and you know, 30 formerly incarcerated guys lost their jobs that they supported their families with. Like this happens all the time. So when, when Damien called and said, you know, there's something happening at the mall. It looks like they're gonna sell it. The community's really upset about it. I jumped on this call. There were like 300 people on these calls, these Saturday calls. Like I just cannot express how large the grand swell has been for local support around this idea. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, owning commercial property is going to make it possible for the businesses that we want and that are aligned with our values to thrive because we can't survive otherwise. We're constantly getting pushed out and pushed around. And so for me, I was like, this is a line in the sand. I went to middle school down the street. I had my first date at that damn mall. My kids are growing up over here and we can't, we can't even afford to live here anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I just 
So when we got on the call and I saw these other like 200, 300 amazing people, I was like, oh yeah, this is about to go down. <laughs> so um, just from that, just from that, we started talking about, okay, what does it really mean to own the mall? Because I think a lot of them had already been engaged in these charrettes where the developers come out and kind of get their buy-in on, you know, and then we really want you to feel like you own the space. And I'm like, yeah, they say that whack ass shit at work too. When they say they want you to own your job, they don't mean they want you to own your job. They want you to take ownership feeling in it, but really still continue to extract your own wealth and labor and give it away to somebody else. So we were like, no, this is not a figurative own. This is a literal own. <laughs> we are going to buy this. We're going to secure this. And not just the mall, you know, the, the, the overarching plan also includes other uh, apartments and homes in the area, right? So that we can take them off the speculative market and hold them in trust, right? So that, that the prices will always be within our control. So I, I realized I didn't dig too much into exactly how cooperatives work, but um, there's lots of great literature about it. And then I would just like to leave with an example, which is that um, you can check out, there's a talk about the Fire the Boss. I did a talk online, but you can check out Mondragon. So Mondragon in Spain is this huge, huge community, right? Um, and out of sort of the ashes of the civil war in Spain, they collected up their own money and purchased a factory and started manufacturing goods. It is now one of the largest manufacturing groups of companies in the world, employing 80,000 people or more. And all of the companies they make, I don't know, conductors and transformers and bicycles and everything, all of the companies are owned by the people who work there. And in the process of doing that, in the process of doing that, they have also established their own university, uh, their own healthcare systems, they have hospitals, they have, uh, you know, just incredible, incredible, they have obviously cooperative housing, right? They, it, all of these things, and it's all done on a democratic, collective, and cooperative model. So what I'm saying is that it's not reinventing the wheel, like we have done this before. Cooperative economics are indigenous economics, Cooperative economics are Black folks' economics, and cooperative economics are working for lots of people all over the world. So, you know, I looked at the Mondragon model, and I was just like, we have to build this in South Central. And, you know, so when that first meeting came up, and they were talking about this, this mall is ironically 40 acres. I was like, that's it. We're about to get off 40 acres, <laughs> and we're going to build Mondragon in South Central. 40 acres in a mall, right? That's that's the mantra, right? 40 acres in a mall. Um, I think that this conversation is really important in this moment because a lot of folks, um, one of the things that you said, Assemblyman Barron, is um, I always say no oppressed people have ever voted themselves into freedom. And you said almost the exact same thing. And so I, what I didn't say is thank you to your niece, Malika Jabali for oh, introducing yeah. us um, because I really feel honored to be in space with you. We are in a moment where we've looked at electoral politics as an answer and are been, been tried to, they've tried to make us believe that electoral politics is the answer. But really what we've seen as an outcome of the elections is not about the elections. It's about a moment when people are grabbing on to our own power, right? When I keep saying the world has cracked wide open and we have an opportunity to completely reimagine the world in which we want to live. And it doesn't mean that we're not inspired, as Nikki said, from things that have existed, but it means that we're not tethered to systems that have always been oppressive to us. And so I believe that this moment is really ripe, not just for modest reforms. Modest reforms don't really get us anywhere, right? But this moment is ripe for revolution. Yeah. And revolution, as we talk about revolution and people say, well, how do you win a revolution? You're not going to win the revolution by, you know, everybody just arm themselves and that's how we win. Um, you know, maybe that's a whole nother discussion. But I think this um, ability to grasp onto new ideas and adopt an abolitionist frame where we said, yeah, we're driving Walmart out of Crenshaw Mall, right? And we're building something new. We're building new economic structures. We're, build, we're building 
physical black community, right? Maintaining and reclaiming the physical black space. How do you see um, economic structures and you talked about the need to disrupt capitalism. How do you see new and reimagined economic structures as part of this period that I see as ripe for revolution? And do you see this period as ripe for revolution? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And when Nikki presented, this is where we can learn a lot from you. We did a great job with the housing. One of the housing projects was two 2,600 units of housing. All of it was affordable, but it also included a 600, uh, what, square foot? Six, 600,000? 600,000 600, right. 600, square feet for an extended mall. Now, we didn't own anything in that mall except for one restaurant by a local East New York resident called Fusion East. And that's a, a, a combination of African-American and Caribbean cuisine, delicious food. So we got Fusion East, they had burger your way. And we said, get burger out of the way because there'll be no burger your way in this place. And we got Fusion East. But the rest of it was like, we stopped Walmart. We stopped, yeah, Walmart wanted 400,000 square foot of the mall. We, got, we stopped Walmart and then the other area, we stopped Amazon from coming in. So we stopped those two giants. But we didn't get anything but jobs out of that mall. And that's about where we were able to do. So now the way I see it now, if we can get Black radicals elected to these local seats, then we can get into community land trust. We working with the community land trust in East New York. We got to own some of that land we don't own anything in East New York. We're a colony of colonial capitalism. We own nothing, but we at least stop gentrification. So our next bet is community land trust and worker cooperatives. And to get our people into that, which y'all could be helpful as a, an example that we can follow as well. So that's what we're working on now. And in the, in the transition to that, Inez, did a great job in getting a black a sister. And she's very community minded, not socialistic, but community minded. And she had a uh, developer. She was a developer, a, a you know, a serious developer. She brought in a project that this black church had the land. They wanted to build a church and some housing. And she said, no, you can build a whole lot of housing and some church. When they, she went to HPD, they told us she didn't have capacity to build 300 units and that she had to go, they didn't say it, but this is what they meant. She had to go get a white guy. So she did and she went and got him. So when he came in, he decided that he was gonna own like 50, 60% of everything and give this Indian sister 20, 30% and give our sister who came with the land in the black church, 17%. I said, that is not going to happen because this sister had the power. We told HPD, we will not approve this project unless it's 30% for the sister, 30% for him, and 30% for the Indian sister, and 10% for the church. That's how it's going to be. So he said, but she, don't, she didn't have capacity. So I said to the white guy, and I knew he had capacity because he did it before. I said, when did you first build 300 units of housing. He said in 1971. I said, that's the first time? So you got a chance before you had capacity. If that was your first time, then why the hell it can't be her first time now? If you can have a first time, this is gonna be 30, 30, 30, 10. Then he said, but I'm putting in 273,000 and the, the sister was only putting in 20,000. I said, yeah, and because this is a mo minority so-called thing, you're gonna get every penny back because you're gonna get a loan that allows you to get every penny back. So what you put in it is irrelevant. She said, he said, well, I, I'm, I'm the general contractor. So he's the GM, right? The GC, GC. GC. And so I, I'm the, I said, well, and I just made this up. We, we didn't even know if you could do this. I said, well, she is the contract manager. He said, what? You're the GC and she's the CM. So he said, he looked at me, CM? 
I, I've never heard of it. Yeah, for this project, there's going to be a CM. And he said, well, what's the responsibility of the CM? Well, I had to make this stuff up. I said, she's going to be in charge of all of the so-called minority and woman contracts. She's going to do all that hiring. That's the CM. And you can be the contractor of some of the other stuff. Oh, will she report to me? <laughs> what? Didn't, she, didn't he say this at the meeting? Will she report to me who she's hiring? I said, yes. And you will report to her who you hiring. And then together, y'all will make decisions. Since it can't be two general contractors, there's going to be a GC and a CM. And you know, that's exactly what we got. I love it. I love it. We could have a two hour show, but we got about five minutes left. So there's, I haven't asked any of the Facebook questions. Um, so I'm going to ask if we could have very tight answers to some okay. of these questions that have come in. And one of the things that we're seeing in Los Angeles is a lack of political will um, by our elected officials. So we do have descriptive representation, but we don't have um, uh, Black elected officials who are willing to fight with the vigor that you all are, with the vision that you all are. Um, so one of the questions that's come in is, how did you get elected? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I did? I went to the Black Association presidents. First, I became the president of my block association. Right. So local. Then I went to all of the block association president, hey, I'm Charles Brandon, and let's, let's fight for this. They were selling drugs on the corner store. We shut it down. They said, oh, this guy is bad. They tried to bring in an environmentally hazardous mm -hmm. incinerator. Right. We stopped that. And then I went to the tenant leaders. Mm -hmm. And the machine had all the tenant leaders. So I went to the tenant, like, come on, y'all, give me a shot at this stuff. Blah, blah, blah. Went to the tenant leaders. They had school boards then. Mm -hmm. I spoke out at the school boards. They had community planning board meetings. I fired them up at the community planning board meetings. Then I organized around issues. The police were beating us down. We marched right. on the precinct. They put up the barricades. I said, we're not going behind no barricades. And I went all over crazy. Coal and then coal-fired furnaces in our schools, take them out of here. Get the coal-fired furnaces out. Won that. And then they wanted to take the fireboxes out of our community because of false alarms and put telephone booths in where you had to pay a quarter to call the fire department. We stopped them from doing that. So when they saw me winning all these mm -hmm. issues, and then it's important to have a media strategy. If nobody knows you're doing this, but you and the people you're helping, mm -hmm. that's not good. So we have a local television station called New York One and Brooklyn 12. I was on there like every other week. Mm -hmm. So people, we got the name recognition and then we had to learn how to actually beat the machine. Wow. I'm coming out with a book in a couple of weeks called Speaking Truth to Power. And one of the articles in there is how to beat the machine. We learned how to get on the ballot to get them signatures. We, we got 5,000 signatures. We only needed 900. And we learned how to make sure that we had an election day operation that we had a mailing strategy. We beat them at their own volunteers. game. We had volunteers. We didn't have to pay because we couldn't afford to pay. <laughs> and I won by 267 mm. votes. It was close, but after that, we've been rocking them. That's great. That's great. Um, one last question that I think we have time for. Nikki, one of the questions that's coming in on Facebook we see how there's all of these interlocking oppressions, right? Um, there's a question coming in, what is the relationship between gentrification and police brutality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think about this a lot just because as you mentioned, it used to be in this neighborhood, you'd walk around and you probably would never see white folks there. Um, and one of the first things, you know, that we noticed and it happened definitely in Echo Park, and it used to happen a lot to my employees who were driving all over the city, is the gang injunctions with, you'd have you know police officers basically stop and frisk mm -hmm. um, black men all the time. Melina, that helped me actually myself when my own husband got beat up and dragged out of our driveway right here. And like these things just take off and they escalate so quickly when white folks are showing up in our community because they call the cops on us. Mm. And that, I mean, that's the most direct line that I can think of is that I see more white folks in the neighborhood 
they get shook, they get scared, they don't understand us, they call the cops, cops continue to patrol. And they're, and it, but it works like so well, hand in hand. It's like, as, as the white folks are moving in, like they have their personal security guards basically with them pushing us out. I they mean, moved into our neighborhood and then they got scared that they moved into our neighborhood. So they, yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Now for the record, the white population has decreased in East New York and our district. That's right. When I came in, it was 67% black. Now it's 76% black. It was 8% white. Now it's 3% white. We didn't chase them away. They <laughs> left on their own. I had nothing to do with it. I just want to let y'all know that. Well, listen, I'm really hoping that this can be a part one conversation yeah. and that we can um, continue the conversation. I feel like only five minutes has pa have passed. I could sit and listen to the both of you um, forever. Um, and Damien, a lot of questions are coming in about how do folks help with downtown Crenshaw? Can you drop that real quick um, yes. about how folks can help downtown Crenshaw? I know time is of the essence. Yeah, we're trying to stop these guys at LiveWorks, DFH Partners. LiveWork is literally, this guy's a close friend and business partner with Jared Kushner today. And they're trying to buy our mall. So we have a petition that we're that we're moving on downtowncrenshaw.com that goes to the decision makers, which include Miss Miss Mr. and Mrs. Barron, Nicers. The New York City Employee Retirement System is in oh. the Crenshaw Mall here. And so we're trying to influence these pension fund boards because we're not getting a fair shake at Deutsche Bank DWS, Deutsche Bank and Donald Trump, just Google it. And so we're trying to influence the pension fund boards so they not sell to them, try and get this Asher Abin Share of Live Work out of here, downtowncrenshaw.com. We're also on social media at Downtown Crenshaw on Instagram and DP Crenshaw uh, on Twitter and Downtown Crenshaw on Facebook as well. So we need people like right now, we literally just have a few days to impact this decision. And I think if they're lifted up and they know that they're going to have to deal with some radical black and allies, they are going to walk away. And these pension fund needs to know it's a new day in America. It's a new day in this world. We will control the destiny of our communities. We will buy them all, y'all. Absolutely. Can we ensure that all of you will come back for a part two of this conversation? Absolutely. Yes, thank you. It. Would love to. We already have it planned. I think Charles and Inez are coming to downtown Crenshaw soon, too. We go. <laughs> Especially with Zoom. Thank you all, thank you all so thank much. You. We're so incredibly thankful for your work. Um, uh, Sister Inez, you began to talk about this, but um, we pray that spirit continue, continues to protect and guide your work and work through you. Thank you so much um, for all of the work, many years of work that you've done for our people. And we look forward to continuing to learn from both of you. Thank you, Damien and Nikki, for your work here in Los Angeles. And thank you, everybody in Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Pro Bono ASL, for signing for us tonight. Um, this um, broadcast will stay up on our Facebook page and we look forward to um, joining everybody once again next Thursday at 7 p.m. for This Is Not a Drill right here on Facebook, inshallah. Thank you so much. Peace and power, y'all. Peace. Peace.